Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be here this morning to worship you in spirit and truth. I thank you so much for those who are here, Father, and, and I pray for those who desire to be here today and for various reasons cannot make it. And Father, I just pray that the, the songs that are sang, the prayers that are said, Father, and the words that are preached, Father, I pray that it would help us to be better godly representatives for you. And Father, help us not only be hearers of your word, but more importantly, to be doers of your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning I'll be preaching from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. God is rich in grace and mercy. Praise the Lord. That's not part of the title, but praise the Lord that God is so rich in grace and mercy. And my first point this morning is dealing with God's actions towards sinners. And, I was, and as I was preparing for this and reading through this, what really came across my mind is, I don't think we can really uh, appreciate where we were before we were saved until we are saved. And then you look back at the mess. I don't know about you, but I, I can say the mess that my life was before I got saved, before I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And, and before we can really appreciate God's actions towards sinners, we need to look at our life before we knew Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And, and Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. And put on your seat belts and brace yourself. I'm going to read these first three verses, and it's an ugly glimpse at our life before we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Made me shudder just when I was reading and thinking about it. Verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Oh my. It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. Oh my. And what you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is not working those who are disobedient. And you know, when you're in the, in the midst of living that lifestyle, it's kind of like, you know, you don't know what you don't know. You don't realize just the, the terrible situation that you're living in. But now that I know the Lord and been walking with the Lord for some time, and I read these verses, they're a bitter reminder of what my life was like before I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I really don't like to look back on it, but, but, but since we can, it makes you have so much appreciation for where God has brought us such a mighty long way. Then in verse 3, no exceptions. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. That's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? And we were all there at one time. Praise God for Jesus Christ saving us from that world and that lifestyle. Oh, I'm so thankful for that. Aren't you so thankful for that, that you're not in that lifestyle any longer? Oh, it's terrible. And then it really makes you appreciate God's actual actions towards sinners. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. And, if, and one point I wanted to make with, with all of us, in the Greek Bible, God immediately follows but. And this places emphasis on God. Now, oftentimes when we read the English version, it doesn't really give us the true meaning of the text. But in the Greek Bible, you have the the conjunction, but, conjunction, junction, what's your function? You have that, and then immediately it says God. And the reason why that's so important, because only God can save us. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit can save us from that past life that we once lived in. And even when we're saved, there's still temptations. I always, when when we used to teach Sunday school with teenagers, and I would always tell them, and, they, and I, when we get on the topic of dealing with sexual sin, and they would always say, well, 
And I was, I was a young man then, I was in my 30s, and the teenagers would say, well, especially the, the, the dudes or the boys, they would say, well, it's easy for you. You don't have to worry about those temptations. You're married, so you don't have to worry about that. And my vision isn't 2020 up close, but my long distance vision is still 2020. I see just fine. And I would tell those young men, you know, I can see women just the way you can. Just because you're married or you've been a Christian longer, that doesn't mean the temptations still don't come along. So it's, it's a daily practice. And I always say this when I'm talking to women, I always, right in the eyes, I don't look any other way. I look straight in the eyes because temptation is always there. And the, and the very second that you let your guard down, then we're vulnerable for attack. So once again, it's in verse 4, it's emphasizing, especially in, in the Greek, that only God, God is the only one who is so great in love and that can, through the power of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that can save us from that past life. And it starts out with that conjunction, but it's contrasting God's action towards unbelievers with that terrible situation that we used to live in in one time. And once again, aren't you all so thankful that God has delivered you, delivered me? He has rescued us from that old lifestyle. I don't know about y'all, but I never want to go back that again, there again. And sometimes I think people can, can become complacent. And I'm just so thankful that God has changed my heart and my soul in my mind, but, but it's a daily in, in endeavor to walk with the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that. And you know, when, when it's saying here how God is so rich in grace and mercy, don't you wish that all people were so rich in grace and mercy also? I always say this. And I used to say this when we were raising our children, and this is just something that I, that I practice it in my daily life. And, and it's, it's, there's a fine line, but I always say this. When someone has maybe done me wrong or done something wrong to someone in my family, and you all have heard me say this before, I used to say there's two things you don't mess with, but now that I'm older and I have grandchildren, I say there's three things. You don't mess with people's money. You don't mess with their kids. And now that I'm, I have grandchildren, you don't mess with my grandkids. And, but I'm always real hesitant. I, I never, if, if, if I'm having a situation with a person where maybe I felt like they've been disrespectful or sinned against me, I never go and talk to them right away. Because I know if I do it right away, my emotions are gonna come out and I'm gonna say the wrong thing. I always wanna pray on it first. So the Holy Spirit will have control of me. And it's so easy for us to say the wrong things, but one of my sayings, I've been saying this for decades, I'd rather err on the side of grace and mercy than being judgmental. I'd rather err on the side of grace and mercy than being judgmental with other people. And especially if you're dealing with some, someone who's not a Christian, or you're dealing with someone who's not that spiritual. You know, words can damage people forever. So I always want to be very careful that I err on that side of, of grace and mercy. And sometimes people think that, ah, you're being soft. And this is something that in my life that, that I've encountered. Because I've always been an easygoing person by nature and extremely shy. For those of you, maybe today's your first day here in the service, you think, Lord, you like to talk a lot now. But I was gr growing up and as a young man, very, very shy. And the Lord, has, the Lord has brought me out of that. And very, very meek. And a lot of times, people will mistake meekness for weakness. And oh, Lord, then they done made a real mistake. With me, but that's another sermon. But I always want to err on the side of grace and mercy than judgment. And, and thank God that God is rich. And literally what it means is that God is, is abounding in mercy. And mercy is, is pardon and forgiveness. I always use the example with, with mercy. If, if you, you have rules at home for your children or grandchildren or for your husband, and 
they make a mistake. Even though they've broken the law, they've gone against the rule of the house, the commandment that has been set forth. Mercy is, that's okay. And it's withholding punishment from them. That's mercy. Don't you wish that more people demonstrated mercy and grace? And you know, and sometimes you do have to, have to discipline people because sometimes that's how people learn not to make that mistake again. But don't you wish that people were more merciful and more gracious? None of us deserves to be saved from sin. It's in our DNA. But God is so rich in, in mercy and, and grace, and I'm just so thankful for that. In verse 4, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. God loves us so much. And literally from the Greek, when it's talking about like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, it's saying that God is so faithful towards us, that God is devoted towards us, that God manifests generous concern for us. And this is one that really just blows me away. God values us. That is so special. The creator of the world. And you look at all God's creation. And I consider some of the brilliant people that God has made. But he still values us. We don't even compare to God, but God still values us. And some of us are less talented than others. I was reading something in, on Facebook, a, a young man that plays for Moeller, his football team. He's a senior. He played varsity lacrosse all four years in high school. He played varsity football all four years in, football, in, in high school. He's all conference. He's a champion power lifter, weight lifting. He's on the math club, the Chinese club, all these different clubs. He speaks seven languages. And he's a senior in high school. I can't compare to that kind of talent. Somebody, the first thing I really like that is, and I always say this about people who are just so gifted and talented. When they're in the womb, the Lord laid his hand on them just a little bit longer than people like me. <laughs> and it, wow, and I'm not hating on it. I admire that. God creates people like that. But still, even someone that talented, compared to the God, the creator of the world, the universe, the creator of all man, and when I say mankind, that means women, children, everyone. We pair in comparison to who God is. God doesn't need us, but he still values us. That is so special, and it makes me feel so special, and I hope that it makes you feel so special that God feels that way about us. Verse 5, God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. What's interesting about this, and when you read it from the Greek Bible, even is at the very beginning of verse 5. Where in the English Bible it says made us alive, in the Greek Bible it starts out, God even made us alive. I can remember when we were kids, you know, as over, over time when you're growing up, how there's different expressions that you say, and then one will, one will kind of grow old and it's out of style, then a new one would come up. And I can remember when we were, were kids that one of the expressions that we would use, and you know, I, I was just a kid, I just said it because it was a cool thing to say, but now that I'm older and I realize it was a way of emphasizing how we felt. And we would, if, say if someone was talking about someone, they asked you what you thought about that person, and we would say like, I ain't even thinking about that dude anymore. And I, now that I think about it, it was a way, of, it, was, it was in the emphatic. We were emphasizing that I'm not cool with him. Because you, you could easily just say, I don't like him anymore. But when you say, I ain't even thinking about him anymore, it's emphatic. You're really stressing that. And here in verse 5, it's in the emphatic. It's putting emphasis on even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive with Christ. So that even is emphatic. 
And when you, just, when you think about it, and I talked about this a little bit last week when I was preaching on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. There is no way that we can avoid sin. And I was talking about this last week, that there are some things that are just in our genetics. And you just can't avoid it. I'm just being real. My dad is 5'5". Five five. My mom is, she says, 4'11 and 3 quarters. There was no way in the world I was going to be six foot tall. It wasn't in the genetics. It just wasn't going to happen. But on the positive side, we've had athletes in our family going way back and being real fast. Every one of the Lewises I can think back, going back to whenever, has always been one of the fastest people in their neighborhood, one of the fastest ones in their school, one of the fastest ones in, in their county, and one of the fastest people in the state of Ohio. That's in the genetics. There are some things that you just can't avoid, and sin is one of those. We have inherited that from Adam and Eve, and it's just come, it's come through the genes. We can't avoid that. I don't care how much you read the Bible. I don't care how many mission trips you go on. I don't care how many ministries that you're involved in. I don't care how many Bible verses you memorize. We're going to sin. We can't avoid that. And I am just so thankful, though, that even, that even when we were dead in our transgressions, God still made us alive with Christ. When it says we were dead in our transgressions, and when you look at it from this standpoint, you can see how powerful it is. Being dead in our transgressions means that we were alienated from God. We were foreign to God. And when I think about, about being foreign, I think about someone who speaks a language. And I don't speak that language. I can't relate to them. I don't understand them. And there was a time in our lives where we didn't speak the language that we should have spoke. We couldn't understand God. We couldn't relate to God. So even when we were alienated from God, even when we were dead in our transgressions, God still said, you know what? I think I can use Vaughn. He ain't much now. But what you laughing at? <laughs> that, was, that was not true. I was just using that as an analogy. <laughs> Even though he's not worth much now, but I can see his heart. I can work with him. All of us used to be in that situation. When we were dead in our transgressions, we were formed. We were alienated from God. God made unbelievers spiritually alive with Christ through Christ's death his burial, and his resurrection. Aren't you so thankful that God is so merciful? Occasionally you'll hear about this where someone maybe has been incarcerated and you, and you hear that they were pardoned. They've been forgiven. That the governor or whoever has the authority has pardoned them for whatever they did in the past. They are no longer behind bars. They've been rescued. They've been free. They've been delivered. And they can embark on a new life. That doesn't even compare to when we were dead in our transgressions. And God, because, of his, because he is so rich in, in his mercy and grace, that he delivered us, he rescued, he saved, saved us from that. I am so eternally grateful. And you know, it's, it's funny when you look back on it, because when we're not saved, you know what we do? We look at other people and say, I ain't as bad as him. I know ain't's not proper language, but I'm saying that to, for emphasis. I'm not, I ain't as bad as that person is. You know, we all used to do that. You compare. I'm not as bad as they are. Whatever they do, we'll think of something that we're going to do as bad as that. And I remember when I wasn't, wasn't saved, and I would think, I don't smoke. I don't, I don't smoke weed. I don't drink beer. I don't do that. Well, there was plenty of other things, but that's all we could do is compare ourselves to other people who are worse than us to make us feel better and not realizing that we were just dead in our transgressions. God's grace. 
It is unmerited favor. It's, it's a gift. And God's grace saved us from the proper penalty of sin, which is eternal separation from God. And a couple years ago, I saw that definition regarding being lost. And I really love where it says, saving us from the proper penalty of sin. And you know what that means? None of us deserves to spend eternity with God. None of us. Because we all have sin in our lives. There's only one person who was human, even though Jesus was God in the flesh, who never knew sin. All the rest of people throughout the, the history of the world have all sinned. And even if you say, well, I only sinned once in my life. Well, that's a second sin because you're lying about the first thing you just said. <laughs> but even if you say, I only sinned once in my life, because of that, you fall short of the glory of God. Because of that, you don't deserve, we don't deserve, to spend eternity with God. And because of God's unmerited favor, his, his free gift, his grace, we have been saved from the proper penalty of sin. And that proper penalty of sin is that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't know about you all, but I'm just so thankful because I know there is nothing that I can do to work my way into heaven. And I've sinned more than once or twice. Ask people who know me, they'll vouch on it. I'm so thankful for God's grace and for God's mercy. Verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. God spiritually and positionally resurrected us with Jesus. You know, the, the very moment that we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we acknowledge, praise God, that we were convicted by the Holy Spirit and realize, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. And I need God to save me from my sin. And I believe that God loved me so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin. And because I can't save myself, Jesus died on the cross to save me, to rescue, to deliver me from my sin. The moment that we think that, the moment that we say that, I don't care if you wait until one minute before you leave this world. It's never too late. The moment you think that, you say that, you acknowledge that, God spiritually and positionally resurrects us with Jesus. We have the keys to heaven. I don't need those keys right now. But you know what? I'm so glad I have those spiritual keys to heaven right here in my pocket. So the, the moment I take my last breath here on earth, I won't have to knock on the door. Jesus, let me in. Let me in. I'm going to be in there. I'm going to be in a mansion. And, you know, I like to speak slang sometimes, make me feel young. I'm going to have a serious crib when I get to heaven. It's going to be better than all y'all. <laughs> but that is just so exciting. So God spiritually and positionally resurrects us with Jesus when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. And God spiritually positions us to be seated with Jesus in heaven. That is literal. The moment that we take that last breath, John 14 one, two, and three talks about that, where Jesus is telling the apostles in the Last Supper that I have gone to prepare a mansion for you. If it is not so, I would not have told you that. I get so excited about that. My second point, people who are in Christ are united with Christ for eternity. Listen to John 10, 28. It's so, it gives me so much comfort. Jesus is saying this to us. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And I'm going to stop there. In the Greek, you've heard me talk about this before. It's a double, neg a double neg. You know, in English, once again, if we use a double, a double negative, then really it's a positive. 
But in the Greek, it's emphasized with a double negative. And, and the words are two words. It's ume. So Jesus is saying here in John 10, 28, ume. And they shall never, never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. For me, that gives me so much comfort. You don't lose your salvation. Some, some religions teach that, that, that you can lose your salvation. Or you have to work to, to get into heaven. There is no amount of work we can do to earn our way into heaven. And I am so thankful that no one can snatch us out of the hand of Jesus. And that's a strong hand. I don't care how many curls you do, how many push-ups you do, there is nothing that's stronger than that. My wife was telling me how Russell Wilson, uh, the quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks, does 50 push-ups every day. And y'all know I'm very competitive. So every day, the, my wife said, is off, and in my routine, I do my push-ups on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I told her this week, you said Russell Wilson does 50? I just did 90. <laughs> but I don't care how many push-ups we do, nothing is stronger than that hold that Jesus has on us. No one can snatch us out of Jesus' hand when we're saved. You cannot lose your salvation. The moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the keys to heaven. You just don't need them now. But once we take that last breath here on earth, we're automatic. We're in there. You'll be in the second or third biggest mansion in heaven. Mine will be the first one. <laughs> Verse 7. And I'm just joking there. In order that in the coming ages he might show the in incomparable riches of his grace expressing his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. In the English, verse 7 starts out, in order that in the coming ages he might show. In the Greek Bible, by, it's, it's emphasizing this. It says, he might show. That's the first words in that sentence. So it's emphasizing that God will show or manifest for eternity his, his surpassing incomparable riches of grace toward believers because we are united in Christ. You know, the first thing I thought when I was reading this, this, this portion of Scripture, God is so proud to display us in glory. He is so proud that we've accepted Jesus Christ, his Son is our Lord and Savior, and that nothing can snatch us out of his hand so he wants to display us for eternity. That's exciting to me that God is so proud that we have accepted his son as our Lord and Savior. His, surpa his surpassing incomparable riches of grace towards believers because we are uni united in Christ. And God will show or manifest for eternity his kindness toward believers because we are united in Christ. Aren't you so thankful that God loves us so much that he uses his unfathomable riches and, and mercy and grace to save us from the proper penalty of sin? Thank you, God. Let us pray. Father, I am eternally grateful for your mercy for your grace, that you demonstrated your love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. To save us from the proper penalty of sin, Father. We are so thankful for that. And Father, we can't work our way into heaven, but as a way of saying, thank you, Lord, for saving us. Let us be a people, Father, who love to serve you by serving others. Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to be godly representatives for you. And we thank you once again for your richness and mercy and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.